Uh, I'm, I'm Tim O'Shea. I'm the uh, principal of the university. I'm delighted uh, that we have got such a distinguished uh, Gifford lecturer this year, and great pleasure uh, to welcome you uh, to Mike Gazhagi's um, second lecture, The Distributed Cerebral Networks of Mind. So now it's a great pleasure. <laughs> Um, yesterday we started and I made a few points. Points like cognitive skills, capacities are largely built into the brain. Our functionality is automatic. Our brains reflect a parallel distributed system and reflect a structured complexity, not a random complexity. And tonight what we're going to do is go to the following points and I'm just going to say them now and then hopefully the evidence as I present it uh, convinces you that there's some truth to it. And we're going to go to the fact that natural selection has less of, less left us with particular skill set reflected in distributed cerebral specializations. The modulized brain nonetheless underlies our apparent, our more apparent than real sense of conscious unity. Multiple local processes, not a single a central process, give rise to phenomenal consciousness through a dynamic competition for dominance. So that should absolutely mean nothing to you right now. But as I progress through the evidence and point out along the way what I mean, hopefully those ideas will take on their own life. And we ended uh, yesterday with a, a question from uh, a student saying, why now, why are you studying the human brain and humanness when you could be studying sheep and sheepiness or whatever it is? And uh, the reason why we're able to go to the human brain and study it in such detail now is because of all of the new methodologies from MR scanning to magnetoencephalography to electrical recordings to being able to reverse things and to actually stimulate your brain by inversing the MR signal and causing a local activation of your cortex. So we have tools to examine the human mental states that we've never had uh, before. But uh, in fact, uh, our history uh, of, uh, of uh, how the brain works and how it enables uh, cognitive states in man uh, originated and has a strong tradition, which I'm going to review for you tonight, from the clinic. And one of our Gifford lecturers of the past, Donald Mackay, always used the analogy that uh, when you try to understand a TV, you don't, under you don't look at a TV that's working, you look at a TV when it's fluttering, and then you can begin to get a theory about how this TV works. And that's the sort of the same idea when brains are disrupted. And prior to, to modern times, this was a, a venerable tradition where neurologic patients were studied, observed on rounds, described, and, uh, and insights uh, uh, were made. But the, uh, uh, recently, uh, in the, I would say the last 20 to 30 years, there has been the application of a variety of experimental psychological theories and methods the, to these patients that have solidified the scientific analysis of those patients that really wasn't there in the bedside uh, clinical approach. And I had the pleasure of uh, uh, working with one of the great psychologists, uh, George Miller, and we started this uh, a program and called it Cognitive Neuroscience uh, at Cornell Rockefeller, which the uh, previous picture uh, was about. Uh, but it has a long history, uh, this path to uh, what we now call cognitive neuroscience. And I want to point out to you the two famous Englishmen, Hewlett Jacksons and, Th and Thomas Willis, of course, who had quite different theories of brain function. Uh, Jackson believed believe it more of a Lash Lashley view and Willis in a more specific view of uh, function. Uh, uh, jo Joseph Gall and, uh, and Hermann von Helmholtz brought uh, different aspects. Of course, Gall was a super localizationalist, and Helmholtz brought tremendous uh, psychophysical techniques. And uh, uh, Paul Broca, of course, defined the, the famous case, uh, Doc, who in fact was the case that shows that the uh, language was uh, lateralized. And uh, of course, you should know here and appreciate that right here at the University of Edinburgh. Alexander Monroe, Secundus, there were three of them, as you know, uh, was famous for his uh, book on uh, brain anatomy and also, of course, as a major structure in the brain, the foramen of Man Monroe that was named after him. 
And this brings us into the modern times when uh, there were a variety of talents that have led up to this field. And I just want to take a second to point them out from Hans Lukas Teuber, uh, who came from Austria, Norm, the great Norm Geschwin at Boston uh, Harvard's Medical School, uh, Brenda Milner, of course, and your own uh, Keith Craig, Emilio Beetze uh, from MIT, the late Pat Goldman Rakesh, Mike Posner, and Indel Tolman, also from Canada, and of course, Andy Clark, the major player in the modern uh, definition of how uh, we are to understand how brain enables uh, cognitive states. So what I'm going to do is uh, to give you a feel for uh, this distributed specialization that I keep talking about. I'm going to take you on a short tour of uh, what happens to people when they have lesions in particular areas as opposed to other areas of the brain. And uh, how I'm going to do this is I'm going to, I'm going to start with the simple. And I'm starting back here, say, in the left visual area of the cortex. And so let's say you have a stroke in that area. That's going to produce, uh, uh, if it's in the right area, and lots of vari uh, variables here, but it's in the right area, it's going to produce what's called a visual agnosia. You can see perfectly fine, but you just can't tell what it is you're looking at. So here's an example uh, uh, given to me by uh, Robert Raffel. This is going to be like a square or a circle or a triangle. That's all I want you to do is tell me what the shape of it is. And this one here? Square, yeah. No, it's not. Hmm? No, it isn't. Another square. This is a triangle. So I missed it. <laughs> I love that. Life goes on. Uh, so, so back in particular parts, of the posterior parts of the brain, there are association areas which analyze the visual information that comes in. Getting into the brain was no problem, but analyzing it produced this uh, agnostic state. But now we can uh, get more exotic, and we can uh, look at other states. Uh, and in the right parietal part of your brain, uh, if there are lesions there, there's all kinds of bizarre behaviors that come out of it, from denial of illness to neglect of one part of your space. Uh, one of the more exotic ones is something called reduplicative paramnesia. What does that mean? That means you think you're somewhere else when you're at a particular place, and you believe it. And uh, you, otherwise, you're totally, completely intact, rational. This particular patient was a patient at the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, uh, Hospital, and uh, and prior to this taping that you're going to see, she was simply reading the New York Times editorial page. Totally intelligent, but there's this specific deficit from a specific lesion. Here we go. There we go. Yeah. I hope tonight that this is the fifth day we started early in the morning. You look in the afternoon, they say, you're going down this afternoon, you're going down at 4.30, you're going down at 4.45. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Where are you? She was? Right now, I'm in Jones Court, in my house on Island Street. Are you going to have an operation in your house? I hope not. Where are you going to have the operation? In Sloan Kettering, New York, I hope, with some experts, I hope. But you're not there now. No. Well, when I get there, you can ask me and I'll tell you. Okay. You tell Ted. Dr. Posner may stay with me all night long as my smoking companion. <laughs> and every five minutes he can say, where are we now? And get this beautiful answer. Sloan Kettering, New York City. Why have people been asking you that question? It's the most amazing thing I ever heard. In the first couple of months, they wanted me to believe it. Mm -hmm. But after that, they didn't care anything about that anymore. Just say it. You know, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. What do you believe? I know that I'm out on the street, Jones I didn't buy this house just the liberty jibberty. This is my whole life savings. Okay, can you see this page right here? Yeah, can you see those cigarettes? <laughs>
So there she was in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cornell Medical Center, convinced that she was in fact in her house in, in Maine. Uh, if you move into the frontal lobe areas and you move into the uh, lateral frontal lobes, you will find even more exotic changes in cognition. You will find uh, people have a bad at sequencing behavior and they have, they're unable to plan and they're unable to carry out um, multitasking. And here's an example uh, uh, of a patient with such a problem uh, being interviewed by uh, Bob Knight. You felt your, your ego was, was disappearing. Could you, could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, that's right. It, it meant very little to me about setting up a law practice and getting rolling, even though I had gone four years of college, three years of law school. Did you have girlfriends in college and law school? I did. How about now? I don't have any girlfriends now, and I haven't been looking for any of them. Yeah, do you notice your sexual drive or, or um, it is decreased? That's definitely. What? If you move into, and you do an orbital frontal lesion, that's the loser lateral frontal lesions. If you do an orbital frontal lesion, you are interfering with the feedback from your, your body, your soma, and your uh, ability to make judgments about uh, what's right, what's wrong, are impaired. You become more impulsive. You get involved in more aggressive activities. And, uh, and it's just become, it just is utterly apparent. And here's such a case that you were attracted to a lot of women or just not attracted? What was it? I was, was attracted, it? very much so. To a lot of women? Yeah. I touched things four times. I put things in my mouth. Everything's an even number, all by fours, eights, or sixteens. Um, I count license plates. I count flags. What's the problem that you're not what you thought you would be prior to the accident? Something uh, that is impeding that, obviously. I don't have a problem. whole lot of concentration. I uh, don't like being told what to do. I've had trouble maintaining a job ever since the accident. I am not that perceptive. I, I have, I'm naive. You I can still take advantage of you on the streets? I believe people. So you haven't had any fights. You haven't been arrested in the past 20 years. Oh yeah, many what, times. What for? Uh, uh, twice an assault against my wife, although like I said, I punched I need to replace the door. The only thing that got beat up was the door. And uh, for using improper. Okay, you get the feel. I, 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 I'm going to limit those. You get the feel there are higher order cognitive dysfunctions that come uh, with frontal lobe lesions, interrupting the emotional pathways to give you feedback to monitor your cognitive states. Uh, but perhaps the most uh, incredibly disruptive lesion are lesions to the left temporal lobe which produce aphasia, in this particular case of Wernicke's aphasia, where what you're seeing is simply nonsense generated, uh, even though the patient themselves remains largely unaware of that fact, because their modules that evaluate what they're saying are impaired. And here's an example of that. Yeah, right. <laughs> I imagine it's those that kinds that we have to get the white and black and so forth, which I'm not very good at. We'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, how are you feeling today? My end regular mm -hmm. today. Yeah. I terribly, very uncomfortable uh, nug of how I dynated with my my track, actually. Okay. Again, you you see uh, what it's like. So, the, so through. Literally thousands of cases have been written up through the years. You get the evidence for particular parts of the brain being involved in particular aspects of cognitive activities. And one of the, uh, let me see how this goes here. Yeah, one of the questions in is, well, what about if there's tremendous damage, but you have a module spared? How, how independently can that module work? Well, th this is an example of a patient who is severely retarded, blind, large blind, uh, paralyzed in half of his body, and has this incredible ability to play music.
So that is classic neuropsychology in a few minutes. That's, that's a rich demonstra laboratory demonstrating this parallel distributed system idea that uh, we, we've been talking about. And, uh, and the classic approach, of course, is you take a brain and you put a lesion in and you get these symptomatologies as we just saw. Well, it's starting in 1961, there was a new opportunity, and that is to study patients who had their hemispheres divided. So we were not going to study a lesioned brain, we were going to study the presence of a function, but separated from the other hemisphere. And we were going to look at the positive aspects of the uh, localized function, but uh, separated from the two sides of the brain. And this was the so-called uh, split brain uh, discovery. And, um, and so again, positive and disconnected versus deficit by, by lesion. And uh, uh, I'm going to give you two minute history here. This is mainly directed at the students uh, as to how life unfolds when you think you have this one plan. I knew I wanted a life in science and I went to Caltech to work on nerve regeneration of the type I described last night. But everybody in the laboratory was doing animal split brain research. And uh, instead of working on that, uh, on, the, on the nerve regeneration, I quickly changed and tried to develop a split brain um, rabbits by putting half the brain to sleep. And, uh, and, that was, and I decided at that time to not go into medicine and do basic research. So what happened then was, uh, you, Caltech was an incredible place for uh, doing research. It had these stellar people, Linus Pauling, Richard Feynman, and Max Delbruck. These weren't, these weren't uh, uh, signposts of a university. These people stopped by your lab, opened the door, and asked you a question. And you had to answer it. And uh, it became an exciting place. And I can't emphasize enough to students that you have to be willing to change maybe what you think you wanted to do, but go to a place where they play really good ball because it only makes you better. So my own particular experience was with Roger Sperry, the great neuroscientist, perhaps one of the greatest that ever lived. And as you can see here, there was a lab at the time full of, of great people. The surgeon that was responsible for the patients that we studied, Joe Bogan, uh, Mitch Glickstein, who now is a professor, retired at the University of College London, and your own Colin Trevarthen was a major player in the lab at the time. Other, all these people, Steve Hilliard, uh, Eric Young and others, and, and myself, uh, this was a, just a vibrant, a vibrant opportunity to take a scientific problem and to explore it. And, um, and what was going on at the time was the split brain research on monkeys. And this was largely responsible and developed by Colin Trevarthen, who of course spent the years here. And uh, the idea of te teaching one hemisphere something in a monkey and then seeing if it transferred to the other, well, that was just happening uh, at that time. And there were these dramatic effects. It was worked out in the monkey. It was also worked out in the cat. The complex surgeries to do this were worked out. All this takes time and talent, and these were the these were the people doing it, and they developed ways of teaching the cat to, uh, to, to train a cat, which is uh, every, anybody in this room who has a cat, uh, you will know, what do you mean train a cat? Uh, that's impossible. Uh, but in fact, uh, methods have been developed, and they've become quite good uh, laboratory uh, animals. And at the time, um, in the early 60s, a case came by, there were these big split brain effects, this, the idea that there was a hemisphere that could learn something, but the other side wouldn't know about it. That was all being very well developed in the animal world. And so what people wondered, well, could this possibly be true for the human? And uh, there's a condition called colossal agenesis. These are children born without a corpus callosum. And so the natural question would be, oh, well, are they kind of like these split brain animals? They don't have this big commissure that connects the two halves of the brain. And uh, in fact, uh, what happens, uh, oddly, is that those children don't show any of these disconnection effects. There are compensatory pathways that open up, apparently, in them to transfer information from one side to the other. So there's kind of a, there was this, this belief that it, it was, these effects were noticeable in animals, but simply were not present in human beings. So, um, uh, and, and supporting that was a series of cases, surgical cases, where the corpus callosum was sectioned uh, out of the University of Rochester, the famous Van Wagen and Acolytus series. And uh, there are 26 cases in all, and basically no sensory, 
no disconnection effects, everything transferred from one side to the other. And Carl Ashley said, the function of the corpus callosum is to hold the hemispheres together. So all of this seemed to argue that the human somehow was completely different uh, from uh, the, the animal research. And Sir Charles Sherrington, in a Gifford lecture, this was a very, very smart man. He, he deduced things prior to true knowledge of what was going on. He must have known about the, the acolytus case where there seemed to be no effect. But he writes, how far is the mind a collection of quasi-independent perpetual minds integrated psychically in large measure by the temporal concurrence of experience? Its separate reserves of subperceptual and perceptual brain, if we may so speak, could account for the slightness of impairment following on some brain images. Thus, the slightness of disability following destruction or developmental failure of the great cerebral commissure between the two halves of the brain, simple contemporaneity could conjoin much. That's a fantastic idea, and there's such, there's such an element of truth to it, as you will see unfold uh, from the actual split brain patients. So uh, anyway, the idea first came to me that uh, after spending a, a, a summer at Caltech uh, between my junior and senior year was to go back to my alma mater, Dartmouth College, and say, why don't I go down to Rochester and test those patients again? Maybe they didn't test them correctly. Maybe they didn't know how to lateralize stimuli. And so I spent the spring developing a test of how to put information into one visual field there for one hemisphere. Uh, got a little grant from the Dartmouth Medical School and drove to Rochester to test these patients. And I was in the doctor's office looking at the case histories, all of this prearranged, and suddenly it was all canceled. And uh, they told me to take a hike. So I did, and I went back, and, uh, and I applied to graduate school, and I was fortunate to, to join uh, Roger Sperry's lab. And as I was arriving that summer at, at Caltech, Joe Bogan had arranged for the first split brain case, case WJ. And Sperry says, well, Mike, why don't you start the studying of them because uh, you've already done this work, blah, blah, blah. So that's where the real testing uh, started. And what is this? Let's just be sure we understand. So the corpus callosum is select section and, and the anterior commissure in the original cases in one operation. And the reason for doing the surgery is to prevent the interhemispheric spread of epileptic seizure. And the idea was that if a seizure started in one hemisphere, and you, you divided the brain. It wouldn't spread to the other hemisphere, and therefore this patient would not go into a generalized convulsion. The patient would be spared that, and consciousness would be uh, maintained. So again, this is the structure of the corpus callosum and the anterior commissure is all sectioned in one operation in the original series of cases. Now this is a big deal. This is where you're disconnecting your two cortices you're disconnecting 650 grams of tissue from another 650 grams. You would think there would be something noticeable about people who had such surgeries. But uh, here you see them in everyday behavior. These, th these are film clips of Case NG swimming in her uh, backyard uh, in uh, Southern California uh, right after, within a few months after her split brain surgery. Uh, completely, uh, apparently normal, seemed normal clinically, uh, completely normal in, uh, excuse me, in bodily activities. Here she is uh, just doing everyday activity. You would not know that this woman had both of her hemispheres separated from each other through this surgery. The next case is uh, case uh, LB, who was an 11, 12-year-old boy at the time. He, too, had had the full commissure section along with the anterior commissure, and here he is uh, just carrying out simple math. These people look utterly normal, undisrupted by this major division of the hemispheres, and indeed are that way uh, if you allow them to uh, uh, not be in a testing situation <laughs> that, I, that I developed. And here he is just the, uh, 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 I asked him to spell his favorite word, and so he, being a smart aleck. Uh,
Okay. So, uh, so then, so what, what? So these look normal, seem normal, now comes the critical time. You have to do the essential split brain testing. And it's basically done, in the old days it was done with a projector and a, a uh, tachistoscopic shutter in front. And what you would simply do is lateralize information to one visual field or the other. Turns out everybody in this room is the same. If you fixate a point, let's say that little point right there, or you fixate any point right there, this image in your right visual field is going to your left brain. That's where it's going. First, first stop, left brain. If you fixate here and I flash something over here, it's going, that's your left visual field, that goes to your right brain, okay? That's just the way we're built. So here we would begin to test the two different hemispheres and in this example here, I've flashed the word spoon to the left visual field, which goes to the right hemisphere. And the patient would say, I didn't see anything. That would be the left hemisphere talking. But the left hand, which gets its control from the right hemisphere, is able to go underneath the table, feel around from a series of objects, and pick up the spoon and be holding it. And then I say, what is it? And they would say, I don't know. Here's another example. You, have a, you flash the word bike, and the left visual field goes to the right hemisphere. What did you see? The patient says, I didn't see anything, but then the left hand is able to go out and draw a picture of, of the bike. So this is pretty dramatic. The, the, there is no communication between the left brain and the right brain, and why all those cases were missed in the, the uh, in the 40s in Rochester remains a slight mystery, but they never did these kinds of tachistoscopic test, this testing, and so they may just have, have, have missed the boat. Here is, a, here is a, an original film of Case NG, uh, where I do flash the word, here you can actually see the, the film, I, fla I flash the word spoon uh, to the left visual field going to the right hemisphere. She said she didn't see anything, but with her right hand as she palpates around there, uh, she finally finds the spoon. There it is. And she grabs it, hand stops. What do you have in your hand? Says, I don't know. That's the left hemisphere dominant speech and language center talking to me. It's the right hemisphere that saw the stimulus. It's the right hemisphere that solved the problem, but it doesn't speak. So you get this incredible effect. So over the year, this, years, this was called, caused the disconnection syndrome, and it was represented in any of a variety of ways. And the basic, this is the basic idea. An, uh, a word, if presented into the right visual field, left hemisphere, is described. The patient can say a ring. If at the same time you put the word key in the left visual field, which goes to the right hemisphere, the left hand can go out and pick up the object and identify it, but the left hemisphere does not know what the object is, what that whole activity is. So uh, that's, that's the dramatic uh, demonstration that the left hemisphere is dominant for language and speech. Are there any specialties of the right hemisphere? Are there things that the right hemisphere is better at than the left hemisphere? And uh, one of the original examples was the simple ability to draw a cube. Just to put a cube in front of a patient and have the left hand draw it, it, it was able to grasp the dimensionality, three-dimensionality of the cube, whereas the right hand, which is the hand that can write you a letter home, uh, can't draw it. It just doesn't have that capacity, the right hand getting its control from the left speech hemisphere. It doesn't do three dimensions, and is where the opposite is the case. And, uh, and uh, then my, uh, um, you notice those filmings weren't particularly good. I did those, and, uh, uh, and I became friends with a young man, Baron Wallman, who went on to found the Rolling Stone <laughs> magazine. And uh, he came down and watched uh, me uh, test WJ, another one of the first split brain patients. And we do this Coe's blocks test. And here's a little diagram of how these four blocks should be organized. And all the patient has to do with the left hand is arrange these blocks to match this pattern here. And again, the left hand's coming from the right hemisphere, which has this uh, visual spatial skill that the, the left hemisphere does not have. As you see, the left hand uh, 
solve the problem. No problem. Now we do the same, same problem, throw the blocks on the table, and now we're going to let his right hemisphere, which comes from his dominant left speaking hemisphere, try to do it. And you see he just he fails mis miserably at the task. Now you'll see here the, the left hand, right hemisphere knows how to do it, and it's looking at this table too. And you will see in a second the left hand <laughs> try to get into the game here. And then we, do, we have a scene where, in fact, uh, I, throw the car, I throw the blocks down and just let both hand, hands do it. And you see they get into a, a real squabble here. Uh, it almost looks like the, the right hand is undoing what the left knows how to do. There. It's kind of like watching Larry David. His anxiety goes up. That's it. Okay, so, so the, the right hemisphere has this specialty, specializations for th these visual spatial capacities. It also has a well-known, uh, 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 there's a lateralized capacity in the right hemisphere for recognizing faces. So uh, here, here's a, just a graphic way, the Archimbaldo painting, where here's a face, the right hemisphere sees that as a face, the left hemisphere sees it as a bunch of vegetables. It doesn't uh, pull it together and apprehend uh, uh, the object as a face. And uh, this, is a, this is manifestly seen also, uh, lateralization effects are seen in the expression of the uh, facial musculature. So it turns out the, the neurology that's responsible for you to smile to order. You, when, you, when I tell you to smile, that's a voluntary uh, elicitation of a, of a particular neurologic network that allows you to carry that out. Whereas if you spontaneously smile from a joke or uh, some other emotional reason, it's a totally different neurological system that's managing that smile. And so you can see this uh, in a nice separation here, where here's a young man who had a stroke in the right hemisphere, and he's told to smile. Well, because he's had a stroke in the right hemisphere, the command from his left hemisphere to smile bilaterally and, and retract the cheeks at the same time is disrupted by the stroke, so he can only get the command to the right half of his face, and you see the paralysis there and the inability on the left. However, the same patient has told a joke, and now he's using this bilateral innervation mechanism, and you see that he's completely uh, normal, a normal fa uh, face. Now, the exact opposite is the true in a Parkinson's patient. This is the masked position of a Parkinson's patient where there is no spontaneous capacity because the extrapyramidal system is damaged in Parkinson patients, and that's the masked face of, of people with Parkinson's disease. However, you take the same patient and tell them to smile, the Parkinson patients, and they can have that mechanism light up at the face. And so we said, well, this should work so that in a split brain patient, this is the case JW, if we give a command to smile to the left hemisphere, because the information can't go over to the right hemisphere uh, via the corpus callosum, we should see that only the right side of the face goes up in the initial attempt to smile. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. This is, first, is, you see this is done in normal time, and you see it quickly. You see that little lead of the right side of the face, and now we slow it down so you can see it in slow motion. Again, we've given the command to the left hemisphere, and look at that. You see the right side of the face go up, and then finally the other side catches up through somatic uh, uh, feedback. So 
All of this led to this picture that there are all these specializations distributed around the brain, left brain, right brain. Some interact between the two hemispheres, and we will get to examples of that later. And this all resulted in a series of papers in the early 60s, and it uh, became clear uh, that uh, this work was a very, uh, uh, very great interest, and, and that we thought we could figure out now the brain code, nothing less than the brain code, because we now knew that if we had a, per, a human being fixate uh, a point and we flashed the word night into the left visual field and you were able to say the word night, somehow that information transferred through the corpus callosum to your left speech center. If we could put an electrode in there and record the pulses, we could maybe, <laughs> we could maybe figure out the brain code. That's how simple it was, and that's uh, unbelievably was funded. And uh, so, um, so I trotted off to a, a great experience in my life to Italy, to the Institute de Physiologia with Giovanni Berlucchi and Giacomo Rezzolati, and that's exactly what we did. We put an electrode right in the corpus callosum. It took us months to get this work to work out, and this was, of course, done in an experimental animal. And, uh, and soon, as the electrode hit the corpus callosum, you would hear the amplifiers were all in the room. We were out in this wonderful garden, this garden laboratory at the Institute of Physiology, working on it. Electrode goes into the corpus callosum. Here's what we hear. We thought we were going to hear the, the code for, of the mind. Well, it didn't work. Why is that? Anyway, sorry about that. I got disconnected somewhere in the thing. We heard the Beatles song, We All Live in a Yellow Submarine, <laughs> and come flying out of the amplifiers. And, and Resolati, cool as he is, says, now that is what I call high order information. <laughs> anyway, uh, the work went on, was summarized by myself. It went on to, to uh, uh, have Roger Sperry awarded the Nobel Prize uh, along with David Hubel and Torsten Weasel, and uh, I had the honor of uh, writing the appreciation for Sperry, and certainly uh, no one deserved it more in this world than, uh, than that man. So, but, you know, this is a tough business, and uh, people keep, uh, keep after, they want to know what's the next step, so what does it mean, what's the implication, da, 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 da. you know, they never leave you alone, it's constantly the next step. So George Miller, Riding up in an elevator, I tell a story at Rockefeller University, he introduced me to William Essie, a great American psychologist. And he says, you know, Mike, he's the guy that discovered the split brain phenomenon in humans. And Essie says, great, now we have two systems we don't understand. <laughs> you, you know, they never let up. So, um, so here we are. We had a dramatic thing, nonetheless. We had a dramatic thing. People, we thought there were two conscious systems, double conscious, left consciousness, right consciousness left brain kind of person, right brain kind of person. It was, if, if these films, the point of showing these films was see, it's utterly dramatic to see these patients. If I had a split brain patient here to show you today and I did these tasks, you would just be floored with what, what it is. It, it, when you monkey around with consciousness, it, it, it grabs you, it's disturbing. And uh, so anyway, we, we talked freely about the fact that there seemed to be two conscious systems and, and that raises other two different free wills and two different selves, and, and you, you're off to the races. Well, when you start saying you're studying consciousness, it seems reasonable to go look up what it means. We didn't do that, actually. We just said, there's two of them now. And uh, years later, I, I decided to look it up. And uh, here's the, in the International Dictionary of Psychology, which was written in, in uh, the UK, consciousness, the having of perceptions, thoughts, and feelings, awareness. The term is impossible to define except in terms that are unintelligible without a grasp of what consciousness means. Consciousness is a fascinating but elusive phenomenon. It is impossible to specify what it is, what it does, or why it evolved. <laughs> Nothing worth reading has been written about it. <laughs> so. So then, you, you, know, you know you're on thin ice, but there's over 18,000 articles. The last time I did a med search, 
with uh, no solution. Uh, everybody thinks why? Everybody thinks they know what consciousness is, the nature of the answer. Professionals are nervous when they talk about the topic. But I ask you, does anybody really know what an instinct is? Can one see an instantiation of an instinct in the brain? When we talk about memory, we're talking about aspects of memory, how we study it, it's retrieval time, it's decay, da 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 So why can't we start nibbling away at the problem of consciousness without having it completely defined? As pointed out to me last week by people at the Santa Fe Institute, our concept of gene is changing so much that its current uh, way it's defined uh, bears a weak resemblance to its original uh, definition. So we're learning all the time and you keep uh, uh, hacking away at it. So Roger Sperry in 1968 captured the split brain double consciousness idea. He says there is an apparent doubling in most of the realms of consciousness and awareness instead of the normally unified single stream of consciousness these patients have in many ways as if they are two independent streams of conscious awareness, one in each hemisphere, each of which is cut off from and out of contact with the mental experiences of the other. In other words, each hemisphere seems to have its own separate and private sensation, its own perceptions, its own concepts, its own impulses with related volitional cognitive and learning experiences. That is, that, you know, that is a very powerful statement. And uh, I contributed to it over the past 10 years. I said we have collected evidence that following midline section of the cerebrum, common normal conscious unity is disrupted, leaving a split brain patient with two minds, at least mind left and mind right. They coexist as two completely conscious entities in the same manner as conjoined twins or two completely separate persons. I, Sperry wins, I, I was a little bit strong there. Uh, but nonetheless, this was the view, this was the idea. We, we were caught in this dichotomy that was mind left or mind right. And that, uh, and that uh, uh, there, we, we had produced a situation where there were two separate but equal systems. So John e Eccles, uh, for those of you who may remember his lectures here, did not like this idea. Uh, there is some self-consciousness in the right hemisphere, but is of a limited kind and would not qualify the right hemisphere to have personhood. He argued, thus the commissurotomy has split a fragment off from the self-conscious mind, but the person remains apparently unscathed with mental unity intact and it's now exclusive left hemisphere association. And in fact, he drew a uh, diagram to show that the hemispheres, how they function and interacted and how mental processes uh, landed into the left hemisphere via the supplementary motor area, area uh, in a way that uh, we'll get into uh, later. But he, so he argued uh, uh, very much against this notion of two conscious systems. And Don Mackay, uh, similarly, I, I, I'll just skip this, but similarly felt that the evidence wasn't there to say that. Well, uh, what, what is interesting is that our concept has now changed so much about what all this data means as the results of, of continued testing and more examinations. And uh, what we have done is move away from the dichotomies to multiple and dynamic mental systems models. There's not two systems. There's a plethora of mental systems distributed throughout the brain, some within a hemisphere, some distributed across the hemisphere. And one doesn't think necessarily about uh, the brain being organized in terms of two con conscious systems at all. And, uh, oh, that little bit of trickery there. Uh, so the, segre the segregation of neural processing into specialized neural regions, the realm of conscious experience, what, what is all this about? Uh, so how does it work? So, um, so the, the story began to crack apart that the brains are not co-equal and consciousness is not, and you don't think of mind left and mind right. And the story began to fall apart because we began to examine the cognitive abilities of the separated right hemisphere. The left hemisphere was this whiz kid that talked and understood language, and the right hemisphere didn't talk and uh, had a very limited understanding of language. So what we did was uh, uh, we gave it uh, conceptual tests. These are uh, uh, of a simple form. These are first grade uh, tests. And the patient's task is simply to find which of these objects when inserted, inserted into there completes uh, the figure into a full uh, square. And what we discovered was that the left hemisphere, of course, had no problem with these easy tasks. The right hemisphere simply couldn't 
couldn't solve it. Just solved them a little bit above chance, but it was, it was dismal at them. And uh, if we gave uh, the simple kind of language the right hemisphere under, could understand, while it could point to the, a pan if we flashed the word pan, if we, and we could, it could point to water if we flashed the word water, if we flashed pan and water together and they had to combine the two pieces of information uh, into a whole, uh, the right hemisphere simply couldn't do the task. So all of a sudden we realized, well, th these aren't, this is a poor way to think about this. There, there are specializations in these brains, but in terms of the overall uh, issue of uh, one being of equal conscious to the other, that's not gonna hold. And then we said, well, so wh where, where is this consciousness? Does, does information get processed and then channeled through one kind of conscious activation center that makes things phenomenally aware to you and me? Or is it organized different, differently? Is there a single mechanism that enables conscious experience? And, uh, or is it more like conscious experience is the feeling about specialized capacities? Conscious experience is, slowly, is closely associated with functional cortex involved with a the capacity, therefore it is everywhere. Now that's the point. And here's the essential observation that allows me to make that point. If you, uh, if you ask a split brain patient uh, right after their surgery, uh, so how are you? Fine. Do you notice anything different? No. Well, now, that patient, if they're looking at you, cannot describe anything to the left part, the left part of the visual field, as I demonstrated to you. How, you, you cannot imagine that as you sit there in your seat, that if you had split brain surgery today, you would not comment tomorrow morning to your physician, gee, doctor, I can't see the entire left half of space. <laughs> what have you done? These patients never, ever say anything like that. And you grow to realize that what's happening is this phenomenal fact that to be conscious about a particular part of space involves the cortex that is processing that part of space. And so if you're talking out of your left hemisphere and I'm asking you about your awareness of things in the left visual field, that's over in the disconnected right hemisphere. And that hemisphere is conscious about it. But your left hemisphere is not. And so you begin to think, well, gee, maybe this consciousness is really local. It is due to local processes associated with a particular sensory moment of left space or right space. And, uh, and to, to, to get a sense of this, uh, uh, let, me, let me show you a, a clip here. These are two split brain patients. This is case VP, and this is kind of a cut-in video here, so it's kind of disoriented. This, this is a case VP, and this is case JW, and we're, we're talking to them. Uh, do you notice anything special? Have you, does your life change in any way? These are split brain patients that have been tested for years and have been tested on a weekly, monthly basis. And uh, you can see that they're completely oblivious that they're any special in any way. Do you guys ever, do you ever wonder why people want to film you guys? Or like, do you have any insights into why it's interesting to other people? I just, do it. <laughs> I just figured it was just for further research. I just, yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, no, but I know, but why particularly this type of operation was interesting? No, why? No, I was just wondering why, whether you had any insights. What I mean is there's something that they do look for while we're doing this? Well, I don't know. What do you think, Joe? So it's joke time and no, no sense that they're special, no sense that uh, they don't seem, the left brain doesn't seem to miss the, the right brain. And so uh, you see this commonly uh, actually in other kinds of clinical cases if you look at them from a particular perspective. So here's a, a famous uh, monograph written by Teuber and others, and uh, these were patients studied from the Second World War, and here's obviously a man with an enormous uh, lesion produced from a, a bomb fragment, and he had this tremendous visual field deficit, tremendous area. He only had this tunnel vision. Well, if you, if you had that kind of lesion 
that kind of blindness due to a peripheral lesion in your, in your optic nerve, you would immediately sense it. You would say, oh, I, can eat. I can't see in half the visual world. Because the input is not getting to your brain. But if it goes all the way up into your brain and past your visual cortex to the associative cortex, the associative cortex is not getting the signal that this is missing, and you're not being cued that you're, not, that you're missing this uh, information. So you're unaware of it. So the notion that, that, that phenomenal consciousness is generated by the local processes that are involved with a specific domain, specific function, seems to me to be uh, the, the uh, normal conclusion. Now, this means then that what I'm suggesting, and we're going to come back to this in a later lecture, what I'm suggesting is that, in fact, there's all kinds of local f conscious systems. Depend and so what, happens to be con what you happen to be conscious of at a particular moment is what's bubbling up, what has become dominant, as I said at the beginning. And, and, and so there's this tremendous thing swinging around in your brain. You're conscious about this, you're conscious about that, you're conscious about this, you're conscious about that. It's a constellation of systems that are enabling consciousness that appear to be unified to you, but in fact are, are instantiated by these very uh, and vastly uh, separate uh, conscious systems. And so, uh, so in my little uh, bar graph here, as things vary during the day, you have all these different uh, kinds of issues come up as to what you're, you're conscious about. But I couldn't resist this uh, uh, video I saw on uh, YouTube, which states more clearly my complex model here. Whoop, where'd it go? It's time to play Whack a Kitty! <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> that was suggested to me by a very distinguished scientist, actually. And uh, so uh, this, uh, this is a field full of uh, humor and fun as well. But uh, here, here's a more serious version of this. Here is, here is, a, here is Case VP, a split brain patient who, uh, as you will see, uh, develops the ability to speak not only out of the left hemisphere, which was immediately present after her surgery, but begins to be able to speak a little bit out of her right hemisphere. Simple little words. So the, the, the challenge becomes, who's talking when she's talking? How is this working? And so what we did was, uh, uh, she's sitting here being interviewed and, des and, and describing the fact that uh, her left visual field allows her to see things more clearly, but she's more confident about what she sees on the right. What we know from psychophysical testing is that the left field, right hemisphere, is uh, better at perceptual judgments than the right in all kinds of measures. And so she's putting these two stories together, and yet to you, it to the listener, the third party, it looks like a completely unified statement coming from the system she has. But we know it's actually information coming from both systems being weaved together uh, by our minds listening to her. And so here you see it. It's like on this side, um, I, it's like on this side, I see the picture, I see everything more clearly. And on this side, on my right side, I feel more confident, sort of, in a way, with my answer. Okay, so this one you see the details, and this one you know what it is. That's it. That's what it is? That's it. Okay. Is one more noticeable than the other? Yes. And which one is that? This one. This one. So, we've got all these systems. Who's in charge? What is in charge? How does it work? How did we become so decentralized. And I'm just going to give you quickly, uh, uh, so we end on time, a couple of helpful metaphors on this. First of all, uh, as we pointed out yesterday in one of the uh, arguments for the specialization, 
there's a decrease in connectivity with increasing network size. And uh, the notion that is going around now that, that seems interesting to consider is that we adopt what is called small world architecture at large network sizes. And this is uh, the work being argued by the uh, neurobiologist uh, Georg uh, Strider. And basically, it's, it's taking uh, note of the small work, uh, the, the small network uh, phenomenon and pointing out that if you have 12 neurons interconnected, you have a simple system. If you have uh, eight neurons, all of a sudden you have 56 axons that have to interact. And if you have 16 neurons, it goes up exponentially to 240. Well, you can't scale that up to the hundreds of millions, of billions of neurons in the brain. And so the notion is things do not have to connect with each other as the brain gets more complex. And then that there's local control with only some connections communicating from uh, local nodes across to the other, other nodes. And in fact, you remember this slide from yesterday, that's exactly what's happening in the developing of the corpus callosum uh, as we go from uh, the monkey to the humans, that it is decreasing in size is because the local control of information is being developed within each hemisphere. And, uh, and so you, you have a, an anatomical uh, uh, rationale for looking about how the system becomes decentralized uh, and distributed. And then you, all you have to think about is, uh, is the Google ad auction system to realize that you can have a system that looks like there's somebody in charge, but there isn't. It's actually you. So how the Google ad auction system works is there's advertisers who provide the list of keywords, ads, and bids. There's the Google users, that's you and me throughout the world, voting on these with each of our clicks. And there's Google, who compiles this list, sorts this thing out, uh, judges the quality of the uh, uh, the number of clicks through judges the quality of the page that's hit and all kinds of thing and comes up with a number that turns out to to uh, that allows for a score to rank whether these number where the wh which of these businesses is going to be on the top which of these issues is going to be on the top over here all of that looks like there's an auctioneer all of that looks like there's somebody in there running this show taking the bets no it's not. It's just the way it's, it's, you turn it on, it starts working, it has the algorithm. It just all happens in an orderly way by the design of the system. So those kinds of ideas are going to come to the fore and I think ultimately trying to understand uh, why it is uh, and how it is that we work, even though we have this powerful illusion that we are in charge. And uh, I'm just going to skip that because of time. And that's what I just said. And so the question is, what is this, uh, why is it so hard to believe that, that the system is operating like that? There is no real auctioneer in our head. How can we just have a hard time believing that? Ad auctions work, sales work with no CEO, mine works with no CEO. How come we feel so unified? How can we feel we are actually in charge of everything we do? And uh, you have to realize that, uh, that the vast majority of uh, what we do and what we think about and how we go about managing our life in the environment we live goes on unconsciously and goes on by these automatic systems. But uh, there is this belief, this deep belief, that we're doing it. We, you and me, us, the big I. And that turns out to be something that's studyable. And that is the fact that there is a thing that we've discovered in the left brain uh, called the interpreter, which sits there taking all of this input, and it's, it's just another module, it takes all this input and builds the narrative that you and I create about ourselves and, and about others. And that is, uh, in fact, what we'll be talking about on Thursday, how that works. Thank you very much. to hear um, the research that our brains have um, no hierarchical organization, but rather are a sequence of um, more uh, parallel kinds of sites of consciousness. Um, and uh, my question was, I was wondering, um, do you think that we have thoughts 
or do thoughts have us? <laughs> Both. <laughs> um, we, here, here's the deal. We tend to think that there is a brain system that generates any particular thought we're particularly interested in. But what we have is a churning, massive bunch of brain systems generating several thoughts simultaneously. And as we move from one thought to another, it's not that they're, they're out somewhere. They're probably very close by, and one dominates from one second to another. So the notion that we have to go from a, a physical, let's call it, we're going to get into this in the free will, but, but a physical state that generates one mental state, and then we have to get to the next mental state by going to a second physical state, I don't think that's how it works. I think there's, there's a constellation of mental states going on, and which one dominates at any particular moment. How that works, I don't think anybody knows. But it's a different model. It's that these things are simultaneously going on, and it's not this long, it's not this sequential, you gotta go from A to B, from brain states and that into the corresponding mental state. I'll try to make that clear with the illustrations on the Monday's lecture. Another question? Um, there's one in the back. Professor, how does the brain get its energy to function, especially when it's uh, exercising or at rest? Well, there's a vast field of, uh, of glucose metabolism research and, uh, and ener energetics on the brain. And of course, it comes from glucose delivered to the brain through the vascular system. And uh, there's a very, it's very tightly controlled and monitored so it doesn't drop very much, but then regionally, of course, it varies tremendously that if a particular part of the brain is, is very active, there's an increased flow of blood, which then is an increased fl flow of glucose, which is, which is basic to the metabolism. So as neural firing increases in a particular area, there's a greater energy need, and then it's delivered to that part of the brain by the vascular system. And this is what's captured in all of these brain imaging studies that uh, you read about and hear about, and we'll be talking a little bit more about uh, later. Another question? Um, if there are all these distributed systems and all of them are having consciousness individually, separately, or contributing to consciousness, then could some kind of disconnection between many individual systems lead to uh, a f physical entity feeling sort of divided or? Uh, yeah, and, and there's all, a number of clinical states that would suggest that kind of thing uh, goes on. Uh, so so th th but the basic point is that, that you can lose consciousness about something if, if, if the part of the brain that normally processes that is damaged. And it doesn't seem that the other parts of the brain miss it, because to be conscious about it seems to be localized to the part of the brain that was damaged. That, that's the puzzle. Why doesn't the left hemisphere miss the right hemisphere? Why doesn't it say, gee, I can't see over in the left part of space? It, it's, it's, it's not fathomable to us. I will show you demonstrations in, um, I think it's tomorrow, or, or Wednesday, Thursday. Where are we? <laughs> Thursday, which show, which show how we dance between the two hemispheres on, on, on perceptual inference versus logical inference, because the right hemisphere does all the perceptual inferences, and the left hemisphere does all, all of the analogic uh, inferences. And, and we can show this experimentally. And so when you're doing it, and I'll, I will show you the test, you can do it in the audience, you're shifting between your hemispheres. It's the only way we can explain it. And it's, it seemed seamless and almost instantaneous, 
But, that, but the, the data would argue it's two completely different systems solving that second to second second problem. Okay. There's a question there, yeah. Um, I'm just curious, uh, you're talking about the different hemispheres and then how they relate you know, and analytically, but what's the emotional impact of these um, two different sides? I mean, is it possible that you can have an emotional, I mean, does it have, is there a disconnected um, emotionally meaning, yeah. let's say, could, not at all, it has no effect on that whatsoever? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what we know is that the emotional states of one hemisphere can be communicated to the other. So, uh, you're stealing some of my thunder but uh, from an, another lecture, but in fact, you can take, say, a disconnected right hemisphere, right hemisphere doesn't talk, and you can manipulate its emotional state by showing it something scary. And then you're, the left hemisphere is simply sitting there, and all of a sudden the left hemisphere uh, says it's scared. It's worried about something. And you say, well, why? has no idea why. It makes up a story, as we'll get into in this interpreter story. But in fact, we know why, because the right hemisphere, we, we scared in a, in a film. And that motion spreads over subcortically. The felt state is, is assessed and known to the other hemisphere. And the other hemisphere makes up a story as to why it feels that way. This goes on all the The classic case in, in psychiatry is, uh, is uh, free-floating anxiety and panic attacks. So someone has a panic attack in a restaurant and they, begin, they say, well, what, I don't want this feeling ever again. And they build up a theory about why the panic attack was triggered. It's an elaborate theory and it becomes a phobia. And so when you take a panic attack patient and you treat them and you take away their attacks and their anxiety, they still have all these phobias. And it takes years of psychotherapy to get rid of the phobias. All of those were theories developed by a felt emotional state. So the same idea. Um, I hope that clarifies. Yeah, I, th I think you, you're assuming that we have a unified sense of self and that this is a fundamental notion. Is, would that? Would that be reasonable? Uh, actually, I, I, I don't think that. Um, I, I think there's too much evidence that the various aspects of self that are shown to be processed by different parts of the brain, but we come up with this theory that we have a unified self, and this is generated, as you will see from Thursday's lecture, by this interpretive system. It builds a theory about it. But in fact, if you, just, if you ask, uh, in an MR, in a brain imaging environment to, for people to solve tasks that would, that would dissect uh, a personal self, other selves, uh, I can't think of them all right now. You can see that there are processing centers that are different uh, uh, in, for, for many different types of the aspects of self. So we can build the theory, but the underlying neurology that supports it probably is widely distributed. Um, do you have any thoughts on why or how most human brains seem to become left lateralized, um, whereas fewer seem to become right hemisphere dominant? Yeah. And to what extent this might be specific or peculiar to human intelligence or yeah. not? Yeah, well, do well, dominance is definitely a, a human thing. There are, there are there's some weak evidence of some aspects of dominance uh, uh, throughout the animal kingdom, uh, but it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty weak. And so we are the dominant animal, and, um, and why is that? How come it came to be? Uh, all of that has been one of the great debates in neuropsychology, whether it's genetic, whether it's de it developed from, with an interaction of early hand use, whether it's, that was triggered by a greater metabolism in the left hemisphere at birth versus the right. There's a million ideas on it, and uh, no one has really nailed it yet, to my mind, although there, there's strong support that there's a genetic gradient story, but it's not the complete story. So uh, people have, there, there's a vast 
literature on that topic, and uh, if you're interested, I can direct you to it. Very good. Last question. We have one here. Thanks. Um, I wonder uh, which part of the brain uh, is um, has been activated when a person thinks that um, there is another person within him, himself, like imaginative or like they are thinking like they are talking to someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, let's see if I got the question. Uh, what part of the brain is active when you're considering the thoughts of another person? Um, no, I mean like um, they are thinking um, um, they have been another person with them themselves, like they exist and two person exist, like um, how how to say it? Uh, uh, uh. Don't know. Um, no, no. It's like uh, you think that um, you have another person of yourself within yourself. Like, uh, you are two person, which were like, um, you are twins, but it does not exist. But you are thinking like, you are talking to someone which is, um, or someone's giving you advice, or mm -hmm. you are like comforting each other, something like that. It's like, imaginative, um, personal mm -hmm. Do you get it? Sorry? Um, let me, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I have it. I, I'm, 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 I'm stuck on a... Uh, on a whole body of research that uh, is, is becoming so fascinating about how we, the, the way we truly interact with other people is we have to build a theory of them in our head and we be, have to simulate in ourselves what they're thinking and feeling. And uh, we're going to be coming to that topic uh, ourselves uh, later on in these lectures. So I don't think that's quite what you're saying, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. So maybe we can talk about it afterwards. Um, um, there's a paper by a German neuroscientist, uh, Wolf Singer, who um, did some research on a, a girl which um, grew up with uh, only one hemisphere, yeah. but she's completely capable of um, doing <coughs> everything, riding her bicycle, yeah. he, she goes to school, everything. Um, consider, considering that, wouldn't you say that um, if we open like a uh, new field of research on, on this, on this kind of um, yeah, um, phenomenon, that wouldn't that um, um, mean that the whole system of locating things in brains um, senseless kind of, I mean? Yeah, no, that's fair enough. That was fact, I, did you, if you read the morning paper, some, for some reason this story uh, it was reported throughout the world press that a patient who apparently was born with one hemisphere has grown up to be fairly normal and educated and so forth. That's not a new phenomenon. That has been in the neuro neurologic literature for years. It's been studied extensively. Uh, and uh, there is a tremendous capacity to adapt. Uh, it's rare when the, uh, the, the capacity is uh, as... Uh, as complete as was reported in this particular case and has been reported by others. It usually, uh, upon investigation, there's tremendous costs to uh, what is uh, possible in those patients. It's overstated. Uh, but, but still, uh, it, it does suggest that if you have these lesions early enough in life, there's a capacity of the brain to adapt in ways that is, are not understood. The same thing, I just gave you an example of it with this a genesis of the corpus callosum is the same thing. They're born without the structure that connects the, the two hemispheres. Something the brain adapted because there's no, none of these dramatic disconnection effects can be seen in those patients. But if you uh, make the, that, if, if I take your left hemisphere off, that's bad news. All right? and, 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 but if it happens at birth, at birth and early childhood, there's no, there's a, an adaptation to it that is going to be quite striking and, and quite impressive. Uh, how, how that works is, uh, is purely descriptive now. It's just you, you get these phenomena, but, but the underlying neurology is not clear at all. Very good, excellent questions. 
Um, and very thoughtful answers uh, preceded by really an exemplary lecture. So let's thank Professor Gazinga again. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.